Welcome to the Daily Bee Show with Matty B, episode 80. Hoo-ha, in the house. Guys, we've got Samantha Moyer. We are going to be going deep and we're going to be getting into some domestic violence discussions, bringing it out into the open. So um, I feel the, the tension and the energy already. Um, it's, it's full on. And I've had so many women in my life that have just been through so many situations that appall me. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna be going into yeah a lot of so hey guys good to see you guys jumping on let's get Sammy in the house hey guys how you doing can you hear me yep hello yeah I can hear can you hear me yeah <laughs> awesome. awesome so we've got the chickens in the background so they're just gonna be mm-hmm. joining in the conversation beautiful and um, Samantha Moyer. Mm-hmm. Episode yes. five on the Daily B, and I know they just keep getting more and more extreme, mm-hmm. more intense. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thanks for being here. Thanks for being the example of a warrior woman and really stepping up to the mark and allowing yourself to be the example, um, allowing yourself Appreciate to be that. seen, and for putting yourself in that position where the majority of women don't do um, even behind closed doors. So mm-hmm. let's get stuck right in. So first mm-hmm. of all, domestic abuse or, or violence in general, it's a big thing and it's going on all over the place behind closed doors. Can you explain, well, first of all, let's start with what our intention is and exactly why we're even jumping on and having this discussion today. Um, so my intention, domestic violence has touched my life and touched my life for a long time. It's touched lives of my friends, um, other family members, neighbors, women. And because I represent women with my worry women network, I will be talking more from the, the women's point of view in this. Um, but my intention is to actually bring this disgusting, horrible epidemic that's happening in Australia and really all over the world to light. Like we need to be having these, these discussions. We need to be rallying together as a community. We need to be honest. We're not being honest. Um, I, I, I say to people all the time, even the, even the acronym DV pisses me off because it's becomes like a politically correct statement that doesn't, say it for what it is and it's domestic violence it's violence and we're and we've made it so that it's even prettier to say like it's not as impactful in how we say it and how we communicate it and just becoming so clinical in how in how we discuss it It becomes stats and figures and and acronyms and Mm -hmm. and all all the all these different things and it's not actually being discussed for what it actually is and it's violence and there's violence going on in households everywhere So on that note, on a more broader spectrum, can you explain for people that haven't had this in part of their lives or haven't really been a part of it, what um, domestic abuse is and domestic violence is and and what constitutes um, something that's noteworthy and something that's worth um, putting your hand up and Mm -hmm. and raising alarm bells for? Um, I think broadly abuse is when any of your your rights to privacy, your body, your choices are being encroached on by another person. Like as a general, as a, as, as a really broad, broad, reductive, simplified version of it. And I do have a link that I will share about this um, in the comments after, and it really does pull apart the, the warning signs and the things to look out for. And that, and that's, sexual abuse, financial abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, um, even, uh, and they've kind of updated it now where there's like the online abuse aspect of that as well. And, and again, like it's very general, but it's anyone feeling like they have the right to make choices for you, about you, and, and have that level of control over your life. Like someone telling you what to wear, someone telling you, um, who you should be friends with, someone telling you where you should be at certain times and monitoring you and, and actually feeling like the, the overarching hierarchy of your life 
to me, constitutes as as abuse to your kind of civil rights and civil liberties of your own decision making. Okay, and and so in raising the awareness and um, and speaking up, what is the ideal outcome from all of this? So, I have. Um, I am going to be a beacon for this now. Um, this this is something so close to my heart, and personally going through it and going through the systems and and going through all the emotional psychological stuff that I've been through. Um, I have the strength and power to keep powering on with it, but my intention is to be the voice for the women that just can't do it, that just mm-hmm. can't speak up, that that don't have the fire. In, in them to stand up and go, this is happening and I feel completely powerless. And I, and I want to rally those women into my Worry Women Network group because I am in a place of rebranding where I am going to focus all of my energy on, from my coaching point of view, talking about power and how to be fierce and how to be strong and that everything you need is within you and, and really... Um, harnessing and igniting that fire back in them again because it's it's in everybody. I'm not special. I'm not unique. It's it's in everybody, but it's just that it's going completely untapped. And how to to demand more for your life, want more for your life, you deserve more for your life, and being up actually getting women to get away from the shame and guilt and all those other things that go with that, and get them all into a group and start lifting each other together as a community because changes don't we can all have the singular change in our lives on an individual level but major changes come when we are all on the same page we're all communicating about it so my intention for everything is to rally them all into my group because i don't have all the answers now but i fucking will very soon if i have my way with it so i will be working on that i will be reaching out um to different people and finding different ways and then I'm also working with a, uh, with a charity called Coaching with Substance, which um, I'll be doing a lot more work with after this video. And it is all about actually helping the perpetrators because I yeah. don't feel like the change is going to come from just always talking about just helping the victims because yeah. essentially, and this is an agenda thing, but just from my experience, and what I saw in court yesterday, that the men are just getting a DVO placed on them and then moving away and doing it with someone else. And yeah. we're just getting multiple victims coming out of this system where we need to be helping. And I know it's not just, all, it's not just men that cause this, but just for argument's sake, they're broken. They're not getting help. They're just being, yeah. having this put onto them. Yeah. And then being sent on their merry way and continuing the cycle and it's continuing down into generations. It's yeah. just across everything. So I want to be doing something that's helping with the mental health and the, and, and the suicide and the addictions and, and all the things that underpin where the abuse comes from. Because if you were to see abuse like a triangle and the, and the physical act and everything happening at the top, all the foundations of mental health and being broken and and um, emotional and psychological instability is what underpins that. So why are we focusing at the pinnacle when it's at its worst, when it, all this yeah. other stuff needs to be addressed underneath? Yeah. So that's why I'm working with um, coaching with substances actually to get in and go, if you've hurt somebody, now's the time to stand up because we want to actually help you because they are hurting just as much. This is, this is the thing that I can't stress enough about is – they're broken too. They're doing horrendous, horrible things, but they're, they're only really doing that from a place of being broken and from being hurt and unsure and not having the role models and not having the support, not having the community, not having the ability to have the conversations. It's, it's not there. So we need to be open to be having those conversations with people that have been victims and also have been perpetrators and try and understand because in most cases that will flip as well. Like that, that, will, that will change too. Like the perpetrator can be um, a victim and a victim can become a perpetrator. Like it has yeah. that cross over as well. So why are we not addressing that and keeping those things completely separate? So 
My intention, to get back to your original question, is to funnel women into this group and be talking about this and talking about their experiences. But I also need men. I cannot go forward with what I'm doing without men. I love men and I need men behind me on this. This is not a gender, one versus the other. This is not a, this is not a, a, a demographics thing. This is nothing. This no. is like, we can't make changes if we're polarizing people on opposite sides of everything all the time. I need men who have men's networks and brotherhoods and community groups and all. I need them to reach out to me to help make this happen because I don't want broken men walking around as much and as well as I don't want broken women walking around. We have to stop the violence, period. That's it. Yeah, 100%. And I just want to reframe one thing is that you are unique and you are special, but there are commonalities within us all as well, um, yeah. which is in power in our creativity and our fury and, and our passions sure. and, our, and our gifts as well. So, um <sighs> It's heavy. And one of the things that we did start, uh, or we, we spoke about before the call was just that is like the, the, the abuse and, and the, um, the severity of, of what that looks like is what's newsworthy because it's loud and it's physical and it's blood and guts and, you, and it's gory and you can see it, but it's actually more of a, a psychological thing that goes back a lot of times generations um, and mm -hmm. like you said, people don't have the role models. They don't have the examples of, of what it's like. And the sad thing is that the perpetrators, that is the best that they've got in those moments. They're doing their best. We're all, we're all doing our best in the moment. It's just mm -hmm. their best isn't good enough. And it's not that it's their fault, but it's their responsibility to seek help and to start getting better. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, well, and this is one of the things that I've always been, been passionate about and I will roll out at some point. So if anyone can help me with this next uh, part that I'm going to say, please reach out to me. Um, I want to be getting into schools and talking to boys and girls about exactly what you're saying, right? So th they might not have the best role models going into their first long-term relationships at 17, 18, 19, 20. So they're only going off what their parents have modeled to them and, and what and what maybe their friends have seen. But that doesn't mean that that's healthy. That doesn't mean that that's um, good habits that they're picking up. They're just seeing what is and that's it. And they only know what they know. So I want to get into schools and sit with boys and girls and go, this is what respect looks like. This is what boundaries looks like. This is what a healthy relationship looks like. This is what self-love looks like. This is, this is what intuition feels like. And all of those addressing everything as a cure later we should be getting into schools and having these tough conversations because this shit's real life and actually sitting down with them and saying you know your parents might be doing this but that and they're doing the best what, with what they can in the situation that they have but in order for us to to cancel and, and get rid of this cycle that just keeps continuing we have to be getting in there and having those conversations with the young people who do not know any better and and speaking to them about what what respect is to each other to themselves to everybody and and them having that conversation with their parents as well and being able to identify it within their own dynamic because it's monkey see monkey do for a long time most people get to their late 20s, 30s before they start to really pull apart what is good for them and what isn't and, and, and what served them and their traumas and everything like that. And if we can get in there earlier to actually show them, I don't understand why that hasn't been rolling out already, why I'm the only one jumping up and down about this, about, you know, facing this for the next generation. Yeah, and this is part of ties into why I'm going to America and why I'm, I'm really pushing to just travel around and touch as many people as possible. Nothing's us. Um, <laughs> and because because um, it does come down to the, the conscious evolution and, and understanding that if, if every individual's focus is on like raising their vibration, raising their level of consciousness and awareness, then that is problem solved. But mm -hmm. it, it does, like you said, starts with the grassroots, starts with the individual. And then mm -hmm. those individuals 
um, permeating that throughout their own families, throughout their communities, and then spreading it in, in, in that way. So have you, so you do want to go to schools and that's something that you're, you're pretty keen on doing. Um, mm-hmm. one, one thing I want to, I guess, frame before we get into it as well is your mm-hmm. actual story. And um, mm-hmm. I'm going to play devil's advocate from mm-hmm. time to time when we, mm-hmm. when we go through this. Mm-hmm. Um, For sure. One, Wouldn't one, have it two, any other way, Matt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but also to bring to light some of the arguments that people are going to bring up that we've already heard and maybe that we haven't of people that are naive to the situation, people that mm-hmm. um, are unaware of it, and also people that are um, just just arguments that, that might come up. All right, so, mm-hmm. so that's sort of the purpose of bringing these up and also um, to just to push and, and poke the bear and to sort of see where it goes mm-hmm. and and really get the most out of out of what we're talking about. So, yeah, we get a, a full... Well, what we Go can, for it. Yes, do a full-rounded um, discussion. So... Let's the start showdown. With... Let's do it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a collaboration of, of love and energy. Mm-hmm. So let's let's start with um, the very beginning of, of your story, as mm-hmm. wherever you see that as when it comes mm-hmm. to your your journey with domestic violence. So it started young for me. Um, um, the I moved in with. I moved in with a partner at 14 and a half, nearly 15, yep. um, just out of the situation that was. Um, so, so it, like, so, like, that's really where it began. Is before that, can you go about set the example? What was the example that was set for you by by your um, the, the people that the, the men and the women in your life up until that point mm-hmm. as a young child? What was the example, and then get into that. So my, my parents um, separated when I was probably 11 or 12, 12, I think, um, and they were very um, separate from each other and kind of going through their own, their own stuff during the, the, the separation of all that. It's really hard for me to go back to that because I've so made peace with that. Mm-hmm. It's really, yeah. Um, but um, the, the example, like, they were, they were together for, you know, my whole like up until they split when I was 11 or 12, but we did have a big separation. So my mum and dad lived in different states and I kind of bounced yeah. back and forth between them um, in, in the meantime. So the, the stability and the, and, and I think, and I think um, it's probably where, where that being chosen and, and when you're kind of bouncing back and forward and, and, because and when I say that, because this popped up a lot in all the healing stuff that I did about being chosen and being looked after, I kind of didn't have my ground with anybody. I didn't have, I did never felt like I had a place with anybody. So yeah. I was already kind of going into my early teens feeling like I didn't have a place or I wasn't being chosen or it, there wasn't that level of stability or someone being like, you know, I want you. And, and that's yeah. where the big crack and, and where my own responsibility came in in the things that I was seeking out and where it, it started to roll out. So um, I got, uh, I was kicked out of, uh, I was kicked out of home um, like 14 and a half. Um, and the guy that I lived with, um, if it hadn't have been for him, I don't know where I would have been at that point um, because it was, it was instant and um, my family aren't in Australia. So it was, there was no one really that I could go to, especially at that age, um, at the time of where I was. So he you kind of like took... the street, basically, if it wasn't for him. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. So, and with my reckless um, self-loathing behaviour at the time... I, I, I think I would have just spiralled even further. Like if that had happened and being having that feedback to me of of not being wanted and being kicked out, it would I would have just been I would have just kept punishing myself if I was if I was um, in that situation. So I looked at him, keyword here, like he was saving me, right? So I went and I went and um, lived with him while I was um, really young, and he and he took me in. So instantly. For me, the power dynamic had already shifted because I was—I had already felt indebted to him. 
already felt like, and I felt like he was choosing me on the, on the opposite side of that. I'm going to be flittery with this because I've got right. so much going on in my head about it. So I've moved in with him. He obviously knows I've got nowhere else to go. So there's like a power shift within that as well because I don't have that, that, that freedom of my own boundaries within that as well. So I felt indebted to him. He's obviously feeling more powerful over me because he's done something amazing for me. So that's where those, those cracks started to, to, to show. He would start asking me to do things that I wasn't really comfortable in doing, but I felt like I owed him. And then that, and, and from that point is where those boundaries started being pushed out because I also knew if I left there, where was I going to go? So I was already in this, this hold of just trying to have stability in a roof over my head at that, that point. Is that how you felt then? Or is that how, like looking back, is that what you see or is that actually how you felt then? Do you think, or is this all subconscious at the time? Um, a bit of both. So that's what, was true in those situations. I was completely disconnected from my dad altogether um, and my mum was living in another state. Um, so I couldn't, I, I, I was very limited on resources for myself personally that if I had just wanted to hop on a bus, that would have been very difficult, very, very difficult. And yeah. I already had my issues with my parents. So I felt like at the time someone who had taken me and had actually put their, their foot down and, and had chosen me and like above, above all everything and everything else that yeah. he was my person. Like he was the person that had taken me in and, and but, done all this. So, so pardon? to, come in and swept you off swept you up off the mm -hmm. streets and saved you and so yeah. there's there's two points i think that um two opportunities that I, I can hear so far first is um obviously the the example that we have and the, the role models that we have in our lives and and the definitions of of how we see um conventional or functional relationships first one mm -hmm. and the second one is the this feeling of helplessness where mm -hmm. we feel like there, there's nowhere else mm -hmm. and, and the belief that there's nowhere else. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know that that's, um, that's the story. Like I, if I didn't have him, then I, I think I would have spiraled further. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we don't know that if you had a backpack, you walk around the streets, you could have bumped into someone that fucking swept you up and had a completely different experience. Right. So it's, it's just he say, but in saying that right at 14 and a half, as uh, it was me, having to make a choice like in survival mode of what's what's safer being under a roof with this person or walking the streets at 14 and a half as a, a as a girl on my own right so it, it's yeah. it's so having to make those choices is still not making healthy choices on either side of that it was just trying to make the best one out of two shitty ones so yeah, yeah. but the, the point yeah. i'm saying is that i'm just playing devil's advocate to yeah. to point that not every option like and there's not always just one option, but at the same time, the opportunity being that if we had, um, like globally or the system had, had a way of, um, communicating that there is help for these people that mm -hmm. do find them. Cause I, I met a homeless girl up in, um, the Gold Coast who just was hitchhiking and I gave her a lift and she was, I think she said she was 12 years old and it just fucking broke my heart and blew my mind. Right. That. Mm -hmm this is out there all the fucking time. And mm -hmm. um, if, if it's more widely communicated that there is shelters or there is places, there is safer places for people to be, then at least that's another option and opportunity moving forwards as well. But where do you have those conversations? Well, you that's know, what it, we're doing. You know, that's yeah, the opportunity. But, I, but teenagers aren't, aren't hearing this. And that's why you're going to the schools. Yeah, that, but th this is what I'm saying. Like, and and most parents, right, that have children children in schools, don't want their children to hear these conversations about real life. It's not it's it's not that we all don't know that this isn't a problem, but we're so about protecting um, them from any kind of discomfort or seeing what real life looks like and, and keeping that innocence. Which I get. I totally get. I'm a parent. But because yeah, they of that, the six news. but then when, when there is real life situations happening, 
I didn't know what to do. Like, and yeah. it, it's not like we're arming everyone for the worst case scenario and, and, and putting that out there or, or making it, making it um, sparkly and like, you know, you can just run away from home and here's the place you can go. We're not making it pretty. But it's also about how did I slip through those cracks? How did that 12-year-old slip through those cracks? And there was no any, anyone that stood up and went, uh, the, the, this is not good for anyone psychologically, emotionally, financially. This, this isn't good. The amount of things I've done between um, kind of that 14 and 16 that I sit there as a parent now and go, how, did no, that, how that wasn't flagged to anybody and there was no one to oversee that is astonishing to me. Yeah. So walk us through that, that journey. Um, where are we at? Where, where am I at with that? Okay. So, um, you mean like double back about like moving in, moving yeah. in with him? Yeah. Okay. So I was there until I was 16. Um, yeah. the guy that I was with, um, had severe post-traumatic stress. Um, and he had his own emotional issues going on. Obviously we're dealing with an adult relationship with the emotions of a 14 year old, they just don't reconcile, right? So they, it, it's too, it was too much, too full on, too emotional, too, too much. So, um, so the emotions and kind of you, you're in that pubescent stage. So you're, you're dealing with the hormones and going up and down and trying to understand what is healthy. And he didn't have a healthy, um, his parents don't have a, a healthy dynamic either. Um, and because I knew of the, 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 it was just like the power dysfunction, the, the size to, versus my size, the, the um, accessibility that I had, the support that I had or didn't have, um, and the, the guilt that I had from him about doing it, the, the uh, power that, that his parents put over the top of me, that they were doing this for me, so they were the same. They were like, you, you know, this needs to happen, this needs to happen, this needs to happen in order for you to stay here and, and, and that just keep getting pushed out and being constantly reminded of it. What sort of, feeling what sort of stuff specifically? Um, so I was work. I think I was 15 and I put myself through, I was trying to put myself through school. Um, so I'd enrolled myself in like a homeschooling program because I wanted to finish school, which didn't happen. Um, and I was working full time. And so I was paying... I was paying for for me and the guy I was seeing living there, doing full time school, and then was doing like had to had to pretty much be across all the the housework as well. And I was still battling back and forward with my my parents to uh, uh, with my dad to be able to get access to my my brothers and, and and just all this stuff going on. So I was being constantly reminded of, you know, if you if you don't go and vacuum every day you know, we've done this for you. If you don't give us this money and, and the power dynamic changed with them as well. So it was constantly being told to me, like, mm. you are only here because we've, we've allowed you to be. So it felt like ownership. So I was doing things that in my life now I wouldn't do. I wouldn't do it. Mm. Yeah. But I had to in survival mode because what was the other option for me at 15? I'm not exactly going to be able to go out and get a house. All my relatives are in another, in another country. Yeah. So what, would you give, what advice would you give to yourself now in that situation? In, this, and in that situation, not looking forward to what you know has come in that yeah. situation. Um, speak more, for sure, because I was working... I should have at least been talking to the other women that I was working with. So I was, I was a, a assistant manager of a bakery at the time as well. Um, and I should have been talking about it more. I should have, I should have been expressing it more or crying about it more or flagging it. I should have, I should have gone and yeah, I would just say, I would say to myself, yell about this more because what what screaming inside of me, my mouth was shut and everything inside of me was going off. My intuition was going off, my, uh, my, my feelings of fear and, and um, powerlessness was all screaming on the inside and I said nothing. 
And it all starts from me being able to express it because somebody would have heard me and done something about it or, or gave me a phone call or said, come and stay with me. Like there, there would have been people out there if I had actually had the conversations. Why didn't you? Do you feel? Um, because of the complete codependency that I had with this man. Completely codependent. 100% codependent because then I felt like if I left, so this is like where my head was at, I felt like if I left, I would be then betraying the kindness he displayed to me. Even though I didn't feel good about it, I still felt like it would have been a betrayal and it would have been like throwing dirt in his face for, for all the sacrifices he had made and his family had made for me being there. So I felt yeah. really tied within that um, to go forward and to do anything about it because I felt like, okay, well, he's suffering and he's helped me. So now in that exchange, I need to be here for him no matter what, as he was for me. And then it just became this codependent, toxic, violent relationship because of that emotional intensity and, and, and trying to find our own ground and the resentment and the, the trauma and all the emotions that came up with that was just coming out of both of us. So is there something to be said about maybe educating people about um, clear values and understanding yeah. that the paradigm of um, what you're that, that saying you're only as good as your last game. And so mm -hmm. just because someone has done something good once upon a time, doesn't mean you need to put up with shit in the moment right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, this is why I want to get into schools because um, and talking to them about that, because the amount of, the amount of people, even in their adult lives, who are like, well, they did this for me, so I owe them. Or someone will say, well, you know, like everyone talks about unconditional love. But up until that point, everything was conditional. Everything was conditional. There was, there was no unconditional love. It was all like, you do this for me. I've done this for you. I've helped mm -hmm. you. I've listened to you. I've done this. It was all conditional. So that was the only, that was the only way that I knew that existed. So you only know what you know. And, and that's why I want to get into schools because it's, it's, it's about releasing, releasing that hold over you because guilt and shame is all self-appointed. Like someone doesn't point a finger and go, you're, you're shameful or you should feel shameful. It's all self-appointed. And, and when you can find a way and, and talk about it and, and being able to express it and display it, you do get to unlock those pressure points of shame and guilt that make you do things that you don't want to do in order to not feel something. And you asked me before about what I would say to myself as well. Another point in that is stop outsourcing and looking for someone or something, whether it's <coughs> drugs, alcohol, codependent relationships, people to save you, people to help you, because it's all found within. And you can't be, you can't be made to feel guilty about it. You can't have the guilt button pushed if you don't have the button, right? So heal the button rather than trying to find someone who will distract you from it or will will be in that in that space to tell you that you're okay and get that that approval from outside it all starts with with where you're at and all your choices and all your power comes from that point and then you can't feel guilt and shame because you don't allow it and you don't choose to have it and you don't have the button to be pressed from yourself that's a massive lesson that i didn't didn't know and didn't learn till probably mid to late 20s um, and was an absolute fucking game changer in my life is that my thoughts and my emotions, I thought were just um, a happening of circumstance. But when I learned that it's actually my choice to mm -hmm. think and feel how I want, mm -hmm. the game changed. And mm -hmm. that is, I don't know if it was taught to me and I just didn't listen as a kid or growing up as a young, young adult, but I definitely don't remember it. And, mm -hmm. um, and even still, I don't think it was because the majority of um, adults in my life, mum's an exception, but the majority of adults and, and um, influences in my life as a youngster, they did seem to just fly on instinct. And 
mm-hmm. as a kid, like I used to literally laugh at adults fa- in their face when they got angry at me because I just, <laughs> I didn't understand it. I thought their angry face mm-hmm. was funny. <laughs> and, and, mm-hmm. um, but then I got lost as a, as a young adult and turned to drugs and, and inwardly abused myself instead of outwardly mm-hmm. abusing others. But um, mm-hmm. that's such a, that's a, a massive lesson that if we can implant that into the younger generation as well, surely that would make a humongous difference in the right, in the right direction. Mm-hmm. It's there's there's not enough conversation around emotion regulation, right? Emotional it's like, yeah. yeah, and and how you self regulate that emotion. We get mm-hmm. angry, but no, I don't remember ever being taught like you get angry and then what? You you feel sad and then like there, there's not enough conversation about how you deal with that instead of just being like, don't be angry. Or when you get angry and you just go to your, your comfort level, your default setting of, of, of what you normally do, there's not enough talk even within schools and within households and within communities about what those in how to display them in a healthy way and still allow that to be part of your life as well. Because then what happens? It's like don't ever be angry, so suppress it. And then it comes out in different areas in your life and in how you deal with it. So you've got your, your own psychological and emotional stuff that you're trying to deal with and then the actions that are going out outwardly as well and then dealing with everyone else's stuff that's going on instead of being like embrace all of it and this is how you cope with it and, and deal with it and these are the strategies in place for you to self-regulate better. There's no conversation around that. It's just like either don't or just make sure that you don't punch someone in the face, right? Like it, it, there's, there's no in-between there. And I don't understand how that's not being communicated more as well. Let's go into um, some of the heavy-hitting experiences mm-hmm. that you've been through. Mm-hmm. And I guess what's given you licence and, and so much passion to nip this in the butt and really stomp your fucking feet loudly and, and, and make some noise about this. So are you wanting to know what has, like, are you wanting to know the violence? Are you wanting to know? Wherever, wherever your mind just went after hearing me say that. Okay. So um, what gives me license over this um, is that I have lived it and I've, I've lived it. And what I didn't realize, (laughs) what I didn't realize was how extreme it was like how severe my situation was. And I talk about this stuff all the time and I, and I didn't talk about this enough even then. Um, totally, Valerie. Um, so... Yeah, this blows my mind, this part of it, what you're about to go yeah. into. And every yeah. woman that I've spoken to multiple times have been in that, like, I didn't realise it was so bad. I didn't think mm-hmm. it was that bad. Yeah, anyway, go on, go ahead. And I want to preface this a little bit with um, just going forward before I explain all this. I, I'm very well aware of the, the violence and the aggression that I displayed within that relationship as well. Like it wasn't just a one-sided thing. I was just as toxic and just as, dam- uh, just as much damaged and, and really want to make that clear that this is not me just blaming because I, and we can talk about that later as well, my responsibility within that and where, where my clarity around that came from. And I will touch on that afterwards, but the, but to talk about it just in like dot points of, of the violent stuff that has happened. (laughs) Um, Giant (laughs) bugs. Yeah. (laughs) Rattled wings are in here. (laughs) Um, so some of some of the the, the violence that, that have happened over my life, um, mm. I've been I've been choked and held underwater. I've been dragged across the floor by my hair. I've been picked up by the throat and thrown. I've been shoved up against things. I've been uh, lifted up by the throat <laughs> hundreds of times. I've been I've had furniture thrown at me. I've had um, I've had a microwave thrown at me. I've been slapped, I've been spat on, I've been, um, yeah, like just <laughs> think of, think of, yeah, anything I've 
um, what else? I'm just having a bit of a mind blank. I've had, um, what else? What else? I had, you know, those big silver TVs, you know, the old ones with the big back had that thrown at me, directly at me. I've been shoved into, shoved into like wardrobes. I've been pushed up against doors. I've, I had a glass, like a glass tumbler thrown at me and chipped the bone in my leg. Um, yeah, like I've had violence, so much violence. Um, so what kind of gives me license on that was I didn't ex understand the, the extreme nature of it because I only thought that I always considered my case not as bad as what other women were probably going through because I was fighting back. Right, which is still, again, not the right thing to do. Definitely not the right thing to do. the emotional as well, the emotional side, the verbal and emotional. Abuse? Yeah. yeah. Um, what my understanding is that the physical um, heals quicker than the emotional. And, and from a lot of women I've spoken to, it's actually the emotional stuff that scars the deepest and the longest. Would that, mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally, totally. So from, from the emotional side of things... Um, I, it, it, and there, and I can share this image as well. There's, there's a image about like how the, the, the circle of abuse starts and, and how it continues. So it would be, it would be, um, at the, at the beginning, constant compliments, constantly like, you're amazing, you're beautiful, da, 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 all, all this, all this, you know, beautiful, nice, kind, um, textbook, um, compliments that you would get and then what would happen is it would get cut off um and then what would happen is the the emotional the emotional manipulation that goes in that is because when you're feeling so um low or self-loathing you're craving that emotional that and and that the, the compliments and the positivity back so then it's so then the power comes in and they you know at the time would start asking for well, if you just did this, or I don't like what you're wearing, or I don't like how your hair is, or whatever it is. So then you would do that in order to um, receive those those compliments and those and 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 those um, that level of approval from them. And then mm -hmm. what would happen is they they would then pu push and pull on that for a long time. So you'd be constantly living on eggshells of being like, because you could feel the tension building. You can feel that anyone who's on here right now that's been in that, you can feel that tension building because um, the demands would get higher and you would start to go, I don't want to do this. This is bullshit. I don't want to do this. And, and don't tell me what to do. So then that pushback would start creating that emotional tension between each other and then there would be a total, you'd be waiting. You would be waiting for it to happen because then it would be like, right, well, if he, if he gives me a, a, a slap, the, it'll calm down again. And then and it would just be a constant um, emotional abuse cycle of um, I love you, I'm, um, I love you, do this. If you don't do this, this is what I'm going to do, smack I'm really, really sorry. I'm so remorseful. I'll never do it again. I love you. You're beautiful. You're amazing. And it would just go over and over and over. So you never knew who you were getting from one day to the next, but you also didn't know where you stood from one day to the next either. So you were constantly going, is that me? Or did I deserve that? Or did I cause that? Was that my fault? And, you're, and it's crazy making because you don't know and, and the amount of arguments that you would have that you would, and, and the verbal abuse that would come out of it is when those demands would get laid, laid down about what they wanted from you, the amount of women that I've heard this from as well would go, it was easier just to not do it or not say anything and not argue back than it was to do that. So you, and then you would just start, and then because you're being broken down and you're being like emotionally terrorised because that's fucking so what it is, that as they're breaking you down and laying more demands on you, mm -hmm. you then, you're mm -hmm. speaking up less, you're talking about it less with other people because you feel shameful that you've allowed this into your life. Yeah. Then they become more controlling. You become more segregated from, from your communities and friends and, and things. They, they gain more power in your life until you're so separated from where you are that 
that you don't know who you are anymore and where you stand on that anymore. And then they do have that power to be like, you don't do this. And that's how it happens. Yeah. And, and the famous question that all DV victims love to hear, why didn't you leave? <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, fuck that. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, Shari, um, because I, I broke up with my ex two years ago and I'm still dealing with this shit, right? And I've got the strength to be like, I'm done with this. I'm over it. I know where I'm at. I'm, but I'm still dealing with this. And it's not as simple as like, sitting down across the dinner table and going, do you know what? Like, I'm really not happy, so I'm going to leave. All good. By this point, they, right, Shari? Yeah. So by this point, they are not only monitoring who you're with, who you're talking to, your finances, your emotions, who you're, how long you're at the shops for and timing you. I've seen, I've spoke to women who their partners would go and check the kilometres in their car to see if they were going to the shops and Google map it to see if they were going anywhere else, monitoring their phone calls. You, you, you are so already segregated from everyone. You don't actually feel like there is anywhere for you to go. And then what do you do? You, you put your kids in the car, which they're already standing up again. It, 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 it's not like a smooth transition where you go, yeah, so this isn't working. I'm going to go out. They're going to do everything in their physical, emotional, financial power to keep you there because the last thing they want you to do is go outwards and talk about this. So it's not just as most women that are leaving are doing it in the middle of the night with the clothes on their back and dragging their kids with them and running. And then where, and then where going into a shelter with 50, 60, a hundred other women who are in that place who have got their exes coming back and forward because it's like a drop in zone for, for them to be coming in and out and, and trying to find, there's not enough housing for women to go. So you're in a shelter on the floor. How damaging is that for children? So the mums look at it. This is me. I'm like, and just tell me to slow down if I'm going too fast. But then the mums yeah. look at it going, I'm pulling them out of this situation for us to be sleeping on the ground with only the clothes on their back. How emotionally damaging and, and psychologically damaging is that for them to see all these other women and children crying? I've got nowhere to take them. And then we've got to wait for housing. At the same time, I'm getting all this abuse from my ex being like, if you don't come back, I'm going to kill myself. If you don't do this, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this to you. If you don't, I'm going to cut you off from everything. I'm going to take everything from you. I'm going to take the kids from you. And getting th that barrage of threats, yeah, just leave. It's so fucking easy, right? And then you do get a house. And then two years on, you're still getting intimidated and and stalked and having people, you know, circle around you and still having that coming up. And then, you know, and then, and, and, work, and best case scenario, you get a house within a week. Okay. How many people have gone for rentals lately, right? If you've been segregated financially, how easy is that to back up your financials to get a house? How easy is that? And how long is the process in that in getting a house when you've got no documents, you've got no furniture, you've got no money and you've got no support and you're being constantly um, belittled and berated from, from this guy telling you that he's going to be coming after you? It sounds so simple. Just leave. It's so condescending and so reductive and so devalues the, the strength that it takes for a woman to be able to do that, it really gets under my skin. Like it's one of those things that it's one of the, the scariest times, one of the scariest times is that you are looking mm -hmm. over your shoulder because you're also trying to protect and huddle your children around you because I'll yeah. find the stats somewhere. Yeah. But yeah. jump in, to jump in, right, to not ask the question at the same time just allows all of those reasons why not to leave to be okay as well. Does it not? Say that it's again? Not saying that it's, by not asking the question and not exploring the option of how to leave just mm -hmm. gives every justification of why to stay in that situation and prolong the experience. Does it not? Like, isn't, that, isn't that always the question in you? Like, how can I better this situation? How can I not mm -hmm. be in this situation? And so when people ask, why don't you leave? That's, it's, well, I'm but sure it can also, be condescending. But it, 
Yeah, but it's also the fact that the abuse isn't happening 24-7 because if it was happening 24-7, you would make quicker decisions to leave. That's not how the abuse cycle works. It, it, it starts with all this beautiful, oh, I'll do anything for you and I love you and you're amazing and, and I'm going to, you know, I'm really sorry yeah. for everything that happened. But it's not happening 24-7. So you are getting those moments of reprieve where you go, maybe he has learnt his lesson. But to go out into the unknown and be like, I'm up against this. Like this isn't this isn't the easy option. This is the harder option because I know what happens there and I know that I can put my kids in a room and get slapped around, but they're not going to see it. I can deal with that than having my ch kids walking the street and starving hungry and I don't know because you don't have the support there. So you are constantly battling that like it's it's not like one decision or another. There's things that interlink with all of that. Like you've got kids at school and then you're trying to keep them in school while in emergency housing. You can still have a roof over their head and feed them and shelter them as much as what you can and take the brunt of it because you feel like that's easier. It's, it's yeah. Yep. Ask me another question because I've just gone on a tangent for this for ages. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> It's, I, I want to empower people as well. And mm -hmm. what I'm hearing, right, is on the one hand, on the one side, there's the the feeling of, of hopelessness and feeling mm -hmm. stuck. Like, mm -hmm. I don't like I don't have any other option. And this, this image in, in our mind of mm -hmm. the only other option I can see is worse than the current one that I'm in. Mm -hmm. That also mixed with, I actually still love them. And yeah. I, I notice... I notice improvements and, mm -hmm. and with that, like there's, there's a massive um, level of responsibility that needs to be taken as well mm -hmm. by, mm -hmm. by the people that are in that situation or mm -hmm. one um, having, having a closed mind that there's only one option that's worse than the one that they're in mm -hmm. by two mm -hmm. that I'm actually choosing to stay in the situation, despite mm -hmm. whether the other option seems worse seemingly or not, I'm still choosing, mm -hmm. choosing this. So mm -hmm. there's that acceptance as well. And mm -hmm. so getting back to asking, maybe not the question isn't then, why didn't you leave? But I think that already answers why you, why did you stay? But mm -hmm. then figuring out how can, how can the situation get better? How can you improve the situation? And does that, does that need to be, I mean, we need to take individual responsibility. So I'm speaking to you as the victim in the situation. But if, if I was speaking to him, I'd ask the same question. Do you know what I mean? So how can mm -hmm. we improve the situation? How can we get the best outcome for ourselves? And so from, and this is sort of where the intention went from at the start is like, we, we want to impact both sides. We want to reach out to men mm -hmm. and women that are the perpetrators mm -hmm. that are hurting on the mm -hmm. inside and, mm -hmm. and go, you, you need to put your fucking head in, but you also need need the skills and the, and the understanding and the perspective of how that happens. And then the victims to go, you need to pull your head in and make smarter choices and understand the, diff the bigger picture of what potentially there is out there. And if there's not, how can we help? So mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe we'll leave that there. We'll just park, like park that for a second, but let's, um, going to the system and your experience with the system so far and and yeah so you just finished around but, but. <laughs> get ready peeps it's coming <laughs> yeah you ready i'm about to unleash <laughs> I'll just, i'm gonna make a coffee i'll be back in 10 yeah yeah i would <laughs> yeah yeah just let me go i've got this um so um so uh, for every, for every woman, right, I would not ever say don't rely on the system. You need it. You need it just legally. You need it, right? You will, you will have to get the support and you'll have to get the emotional stuff elsewhere because they don't give a shit, right? And that's the damn truth. They do not give a shit about your so, emotions. Your... Can I jump in quickly? Mm -hmm. Now where you are, right, and, mm -hmm. yes, you're sort, of, you're sort of still in it, but you're, you're reaching sort of um... – moving towards the the um the asshole hand of, of this experience mm -hmm. um can you tell women now or people that are in those situations as on the victim side of it that there is mm -hmm. other options and they're not and and the other options 
aren't necessarily worse than the situation they're in? Or can you strongly say, <laughs> reach out to other people, like you said to 15-year-old self, mm -hmm. speak the fuck up and, and scream about mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. and that is actually a better option than staying in the situation. Mm -hmm. And all those um, excuses aren't, aren't necessarily as strongly as out of it as what they felt like in it. So I think, it, I think it's if you are going to channel anything in, in those situations with whatever you're, with whatever you're going through and, and whatever stage within, within that that you're going through is, is knowing that whatever the future looks like or whatever you're afraid the future looks like, it has to and it will be and you deserve better than this shit, right? Like, like and actually, and, and really knowing that, like really going, I have been through, one of the videos that I recorded yesterday was, was about even if you're only 1% braver than your fear, it's still better than, than and, and understanding that, that this is not enough. At the level that it's at, you may know it, you may, you may know how to work it while you're in it and, and going through the system, but understand that it's, I think I said it to you yesterday, Maddie, like it's a marathon and this tail end of it is like that last 100 metres and it's like this is you not proving to the perpetrators in this. It's about having that knowing that this is you proving to yourself that you deserve more than this and you have to you have to build that knowing. Like you have to keep. If you can't do anything else other in that situation than spend six months completely building that up and just being so sure about that. So when you are going through these shitty systems, you are just going to be drawing from that all the time because your ne the the change will never come from anyone but you. And 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 the self-reliance and the self-resilience in those moments is, is like you're going to have to face fears, you're going to have to go into the unknown, but you have it all in you because you've dealt with worse. It is the systems are not as bad as being punched in the face, right, or being attempt, as someone attempting to drown you in the bath. It is not worse. It may feel worse because you don't know what to expect, whereas in those bad situations you do know what's coming and you can mm. deal with that, but it's still better than this and and about really working through that that knowing from that and point. you may feel alone like valerie just put on you may feel alone mm -hmm. but when you scream you will your it won't fall on deaf ears maybe for a little bit and but mm -hmm. only for a little bit as well because it's directly interlinked with your own self-worth and what you and how you feel so this isn't yep. screaming about it once this is about going you know what? Like, this is my life. Like, I do deserve better than this. And if no one else is going to listen to me, I'm going to keep screaming until someone listens to me because I deserve better than this. And you have to, it's, it's not about, and, and that is where that power comes from, is being totally self, self-responsible for all of it. So if no one's listening, just keep yelling and not yelling for anyone else, but you keep yelling and keep talking yeah. about it. Because the, the help will come if you truly believe that it will come and that you deserve more. But if, you, if you're not talking about it, it won't come. And it's just going to keep playing into that self-worth feedback loop that no yeah. one's going to choose you. And you're trying to break that cycle from outsourcing from other people saving you to finally saving yourself. So yell about it for you. Do what you've got to do for you. Feel empowered for you don't reach for shitty men to save you don't reach for al alcohol and drugs to fill the void or or you know asking someone else. it has to start with you and if you've got to keep yelling about it until it finally clicks into place to go yeah i'm done i'm done i'm out this is enough then that's what yeah. you've got to do because it's you proving it to you not to anybody else and would you subscribe to the notion that our relationships are a direct reflection of our own self-worth? For sure. 100%. 100%. I know exactly where my responsibility was in calling in, in those relationships. I know exactly where the codependency came from. I know exactly where, where, um, 
where I manifested that, like where that came from and why I stayed, why I allowed it, why I, I know all my responsibility in that. I was broken. I wanted someone to, to, to choose me because, as I said at the beginning of the video, I felt like no one was choosing me. So I had someone stand up and say, oh, I got you. Like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, look after you and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do, I, I'm gonna do that. But no self-respecting man would want to come in after that amount of time and save me. He'd say, you've got this, you save yourself, I'll be here as a supporter. So I was calling that same kind of trauma into my life and the only way for, for uh, anyone to come in and feel like they want to save me was me calling in someone who was just as broken. Totally on me, 100%. percent I'd like to hear what other people that are watching or watching a replay have on that as well, like if that's been your experience and, and subscribe to that notion. But, yeah, let's get back to your experience with the system and where that's at. Mm -hmm. How are we going for time? Are we good? Um, We've only got now. So time is better than we <laughs> um, So the system. So, yeah, it's been an hour, uh, so do, you, do you want to keep it to a certain time or what would you no, well, I mean, it's up to you. It's up to everyone. I mean, we can always come back for a part two if you want. I like, I'm just checking on your timing. Um, yep. let's, yeah. let's go through this and um, yeah, let's go for another sort of 15 minutes or so. Okay. So I, the, the, the way that it all kind of, so my ex and I have been broken up for nearly two years um, and he moved into, an, it moved to another place it was fine um but i i was single for 12 to 18 months so it was never never a problem um at that point where it all kind of came to came crashing in on itself was when i did start going out and dating and seeing people the the level of stalking and um intimidation and, and all that stuff it just and threats and violence and all that, of all that stuff all all started to flare back up because Obviously, that cord was being, has been cut, so that codependency has been, been cut. So it all kind of came to a head. And it was about three weeks ago I was getting uh, phone calls from him threatening to come up to my house and um, threatening me, threatening uh, to come into my work, was going, you know, looking at, at you know, just the level of intimidation and threats was just out of this world. So I had to call the police. Now, I wasn't in a direct threat and I'm not going to clog the phones up, so I called Police Link about it and put a, put a report in. So one of the things that I noticed within that system was that when I – all I inquired about was what I needed to do to get a restraining order. I didn't need it there and then, but I wanted to inquire about what, what that looked like. And um, one of, one of the, the key things that stood out was when she said – and I get why – but she said, we need to take all your details and all his details and we're going to contact him. So I haven't even put an official report in and they're already telling me that me having this conversation means they're going to mobilise and do this. So my instant fear was that if he gets flagged, this is happening and I'm just inquiring, why am I going to be reaching out was my, the one thing. And the second thing that I said to her on the phone was, anyone who's been in a DV relationship, a lot of the power and control is forced upon you. You don't, have, um, you don't have control and power in that situation and she's just taken that from me as well. So she mm. has then told me what I have to do and they're going to do this regardless of what I want. I said, so I'm fine. I get why you're doing it. But for anyone else who's just inquiring, mm. you're doing something and forcing that mobilisation before I'm ready and, and outside of my choice again right, which is totally triggering for anyone who's, who's yeah. been in that situation. Took my details, was supposed to call me the next day. That was on the Thursday. They called me at 7 o'clock on the Saturday, Saturday night and I was out so I couldn't talk about it. I wasn't going to talk about it all in the middle of a restaurant. Um, so they were meant to call me the next day, didn't. So I went into the police station because there was this, this report with all my details across it. Went in there in the morning. They were really, really busy. I stood in front of 15 people at the desk crying 
because I was panicked now that this was going to go into action and I wasn't ready and I just was inquiring and it was just about to roll out and, and this is what they had told me, um, didn't get taken into another room after being asked about it. 15 people standing behind me and I'm having to explain all of this in front of all these other people, all right? So privacy and confidentiality, awesome. It didn't matter that it was a sensitive topic. It didn't matter that... Um, uh, because because I work predominantly in Toowoomba, I kind of wanted to keep all this on the down low. That was just, who cares about that? So it dealt with that. They were too busy, so asked me to come back four hours later because I'd have been waiting there for the whole time. So I left, yeah. came back. I was there with my son, my youngest son, and I didn't want my son to go back and <clears throat> flag this man that I'd been in the police station because my children are brought up not to keep secrets. So I knew that my time was now limited because I was in there with him. They were too busy. They said the report would take over two hours. I had to pick up my eldest son from school. So they sent me away um, and I was meant to go back on the Tuesday. I had to work. So the Wednesday, and this is just my situation with the, the system, so just stop me if I'm going on too much of a tangent. Um, then the Wednesday I was at work and was getting phone calls. He was on a day off and was getting phone calls. He was coming to my work there and then. He was driving up, it was his day off, and he was coming, he was coming to see me. I was alone in where I was working. No staff, no clients at the time, completely by myself. So I had to ring um, a different police station and say, okay, I need this done right now. I can't wait. I can't be sent away. I need this report done and I need this protection order today because he was losing it and going off his head about everything. So he rocked up at my work um, and we had conversations um, and, and, the, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, threats and, every, and, and all the stuff and we had that. The police then came out afterwards um, and did the report and I needed that because it was his night with the kids and I was going to be picking them up and I knew he was just at his peak anger, like it was kicking off and it was kicking off today. And I rang them and they didn't think that they could get that report through in time and I and they were amazing, this different police station, they were absolutely amazing that um, that they ended up getting it done and pushed through and met me where I collected the kids and put it down, right? But, you know, that experience was, I don't know, I don't know. Do you want to share anything on that? Like, do you want to ask anything on that? Well, I mean, I was there watching from the distance. Um, mm -hmm. I was staying with them for a little while and, and got to just see the inside of, of that behind the story. And um, it's really scary. And like I, I am grateful that I'm a big bloke and that just generally speaking, I can go places where I wouldn't recommend women walking around at nighttime and um, I'm just naturally safer in society um, mm -hmm. just because of my size and my sex as um, that is just is what it is. Um, but yeah, I, I recognize like seeing the, how severe it, it felt at the time mm -hmm. and, um, how would you just like really required instant action. And when it didn't come, mm -hmm. like <clears throat> there's really nothing to do other than, um, hide, protect yourself until the, the paper pushing gets to where it needs to be unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the questions I remember us asking was like, there's, there's got to be a justification for it and a reason why it is the way it is. Even if the reason is like we said earlier on today is just, it's an outdated system or if it's mm -hmm. that they're backed up with other work and there's, there's just not the manpower, like whatever it is, like there's a reason, but when you're in the heat of the moment and you just feel unsafe and need, like you need protecting, Mm -hmm. No, nothing matters. Like you're just doing whatever you fucking can to protect yourself mm -hmm. and your kids in this place mm -hmm. as well. Um, and 
it was it was just an eye-opening experience to see it from that from that side. Well, um, I'm I'm a strong chick, right? And you were there on the Monday when I got back from the police station, being told that just come back, come back later, and then didn't do it. And you saw it, like you saw the. There's, they're not doing anything. They can't do anything. I've just been turned away. What do I do? And just that level of, you know, was- upset. And, yeah, I was a mess mm-hmm. about that. Like I was completely petrified and there was nothing that I could that I could do. And then the action on that Wednesday, trying to get it in place, I was back and forward on, on phone calls. And like I said, the, the, the policemen in that were amazing. Like they really did push it hard because they he had already been there and he was already threatening but it was like I had to really really be like I need this today like right now I need this right now and and the fear like you saw it like he got served and I came back and panicked and wanted to run I put the kids in the car and wanted to run and just disappear for a little while because it was still it it, it, people don't just get served papers. Irrational people don't just get served papers and go, oh, okay, cool, sweet. Like, if they've got no regard for their own life or yeah. or are completely irrational, yeah. they, they're not going to be taking that information well. Yeah. And just so, to, to touch yeah. on, um, Shari put a few comments like they don't understand and um, they don't care and and they, um, there's no protection. I like, I don't, I don't believe that as well. There, there's, I've seen, I've seen people be protected and I've seen, um, police and, and people on an individual level have a lot of care and empathy and understanding for the situations. Um, but they, they too are handicapped by their own systems that they didn't put into practice, but they've got to abide by. And mm-hmm. so, it's, it's bigger than just the individuals at the, at the police stations. And, um, and it's bigger than just the, the prime minister or whoever's in charge. Like it's, it is a collective, it's our collective consciousness of, of everyone that's come before us and the present people that have this, this system in the way that it is. And that's why mm-hmm. by speaking up and, and creating a collective understanding and movement um, is essentially the way that anything does get changed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course, Shari, you're speaking about your own experience, 100%. That's all we can talk on, but yeah. Yeah, 100%. And, and um, I think like Catherine um, said, like there's just so much of it. So one of the stats I was um, told this morning was in 2016, yeah. there was 652,000 DVOs put in place. Now, they're the ones that have been actually actioned and put through. I went seven years without doing yeah. a, a DVO or anything like that. So wh- where are the numbers of the women that are just suffering with this in silence? 652,000 yeah. in one year. Yeah. Like this, this is a problem. This is a national, national problem that we're all being too quiet about. We're all not talking about because... I think, and, and I can only speak from my own experience, but I think for most women, they do think that other women are having it harder. It is crazy making while you're in it. And, and, they, and they do feel that sense of responsibility. So they don't want to put their hand up because if they feel that sense of responsibility within the moment, then they feel like they've caused it or they deserve it, right? Because that's where that responsibility flips, where they feel like, and, and because of that, they're not going to reach out and they're not going to say anything because they feel like everyone, like someone else, they're not going to take that manpower away from something that they can manage or something that they don't feel is, or, you know, he's just, he's, he's just calling me every name under the sun and abusing me, but I'm not getting, I'm not getting um, a knife held to my throat. So that's on the scale of it. It's not that abusive. Right. So, and, and like I said, I'll share the link um, a little bit later about all that, but it, 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 it's not just having to be at the extreme case to be able to report abuse and being able to report it earlier means that the, the, the rehabilitation for the perpetrators and the, and the um, trauma that you're not going to experience by reporting it earlier helps everybody. Like it's not just, it's not just waiting until it's at its absolute extreme before you feel like, you know, it is not right 
for anybody, anybody to be abusing their power and asserting their power over your rights to your yourself, your choices and anything you're doing at any level, whether it's verbal, emotional, physical, financial, sexual, um, online, all of those things, there, there is, it, it doesn't have to be this stigmatised or stereotypical behaviour where it is at its most abusive that you can picture before it needs to be actioned. I now don't tolerate anybody talking to me badly and I don't give a shit who you are. That is, and that is, I will yell about that and I will say it and I will speak it because it, it, that me just asserting that even if it was just someone in a shop is them going, oh, okay, like I didn't realise, right? Like it, it can be as simple as that, that that little thing changes things. So it, at every level, if you feel like your power is being abused or you feel like your choices are being, um, are having, you know, power over like thro- overthrowing your own personal power that's that is using your civil rights like that is a fucking problem and but and yeah, it's, it's self-abuse like keeping yourself in those situations is a is a form of self-harm as well mm-hmm. and it like you we can only fix ourselves or fix we can we can only control ourselves we can't control anyone else and so understanding that and really taking responsibility for our own self-care is, um, mm-hmm. is, is really massive. And I, I really see an opportunity for like a private organization to really be the middleman in between the police uh, like the, and, and the, the victims and the perpetrators um, where, because I know that a lot of people, they don't want to go to that extreme of, of getting the law involved because of how extreme it does, perce- it's perceived to be. Um, mm-hmm. But I do, I do see an opportunity for a, um, like a middleman um, or a middle corporation or organization that is there mm. um yeah to to give a helping hand you know, we'll talk about that further but um do you feel like we've um met the intention and spoken on that or is there something else mm. you'd like to um put out there or any call, call to action you'd like to put out there and yeah, so I mean, I uh, I still feel like there's heaps more. I'll be <laughs> look out number six. I'm gonna be back, um, but oh, breathe, Sammy. We got you. <laughs> Love you, girl. Um, <laughs> um, I think um, the the call to action and the intention is look for any woman going through anything. Use the system. Call call the police. Get yourself out of it. Just get out. Get out. Don't think that it's going to get better because you're both going to reenact your your behaviours, whether it's um, dominance and submission, you're both going to keep reenacting it. Get out, someone has to break the cycle. And if it means it's going to be hard, you've been through harder, so just get out of it because it isn't going to get any better without some kind of intervention and it's not going to get better. You, the one thing that I've learned in my own experience is I can't do it all, I can't contain it all, I can't manage it all. I have to go for outside help. So it, it, it is not going to get better if two people who are acting exactly the same um, just continue to repeat those cycles in whichever form that that is, right? So get out, use the systems the way that you need them. But also talk about this more. Talk about it. Share about it. Use your experiences. Get online and do videos. Get engaged in support groups. Fund things within your community. Listen to the women that are talking to you and the men or whoever. Listen to them and take it seriously. Direct them. When they're looking for help, direct them because if they're asking, they're already feeling defeated enough to ask. So stand up for them while they're weak and direct them where they need to be going. Take them to the police station. Take them to shelters. Offer them a place in your house. Listen to when they're talking. Be available on the phone for them when they, when they need it. You need to you need to be for them when they are because if someone is reaching out for help, that may be the last option and the only option that they've got left within them. So be be the person that stands up for them. And and my call to action is if you have any women in your life right now and, and the and the tangent that I'm on right now and where I'm redirecting my focus, 
please come over and join me at the Warrior Women Network because I am refocusing this. I am re um, redesigning all my programs that we are going to be talking about how to be fierce, how to be strong, how to access your personal power, how to, how to believe in yourself when, every, when you feel like everyone around you doesn't, how to stand up for yourself and be your own cheerleader. And that doesn't matter what that looks like spanning outside of yourself. Is that beasting? Um, that the yeah, um, that it doesn't matter um, what anyone is telling you you are capable of or not capable of. That you believe it, and that has to be grown. That has to be worked on. That has to be built. That has to be that has to be constantly used and and felt and and healed and all of the things you need. All of that. So. Bring yourselves and the women over to the Worry Women Network online group um, because I'm going to be changing everything. I'm going to be underground for a couple of um, weeks, changing everything, but this is where my focus is. My work with Coaching with Substance, um, it, I don't even think that it's fully ready yet, but this is where I want a call to action for everyone that sees this video. What ha is going to happen with this charity is that if everyone just puts in $10, we are putting money together to help the perpetrators. We are going to hit it at the ground level. We're not going to just help victims and send the perpetrators on their way to continuously keep victimising other people. We are going to get them because we need to focus on mental health. We need to focus on addiction. We need to focus on um, suicide. We need to focus on support. We need to focus on communication and community engagement and being and, and having that support for men, for women, for children, for teens, for everyone. And, and the money is going to be so that if someone has an addiction or they are a perpetrator of this and they want to go forward and change but they can't afford it or they can't get into a... You can nominate them. Your community can nominate them and pay for it so they can actually get the help they, they need rather than just expecting them to go on a waiting list for a, a program that they might get access to in 10 weeks' time and it's purely up to their will of change, which most people will default back out of when it becomes too confronting because they're doing it on their own. This charity is about making sure that they're incubated for eight weeks and they've got people around them in constant mentorship, constant communication to get it moving forward. So if you haven't seen Coaching with Substance, please go over there. I'm going to share a link for it. But when I get moving and I mobilise this, I'm going to call on everyone to make this a problem because this ain't my problem. This ain't just your problem, Matt. This is a national problem and we all need to be Lovely. together because we need to fix this from the ground up. The systems are in place to, to deal with the overarching um, issues, but we need to be at a community level dealing with the mental health and the domestic violence and the suicide and all the addictions and everything like that. We can't keep expecting governments who have a blanket system to help us. We need to look at to our left and our right and we need to see that people need help and we need to actually band together and provide it in whichever form that that is. That's my call to action. <laughs> I love it. And just to, to, to add to that as well, um, the, the greatest way that we can impact literally global movement is by working on yourself, by being the example that you want to see in others, by, by being the best version of yourself and by really doing everything you can to continue to, to grow and evolve and work on your own inner, inner development so that you are stepping up and you are being the best version of you that you possibly can be. And by doing that, you will set the example for everyone around you. You will be vibrating at a higher rate and you will just have that impact across the world. And so um, I just implore people to, yes, we're talking about domestic violence and this is the topic of the conversation, but it's also a, a level of embracing and accepting that this is where it's at and, and not mm -hmm. resisting because what we do resist persists. And so by accepting that we are exactly where we need to be and we get exactly what we need and that everything mm -hmm. that has come that is going to come is exactly what we need for our journey of, of our own evolution is going to mm -hmm. is going to be what what we need to continue to to grow and evolve so we can be the best version of ourselves and set that example for others and mm -hmm. so others can follow suit in that in that journey as well um so guys samantha thank you so much and i know we have just thank you for having me to the scrap of the surface <laughs> yeah <laughs> um guys thanks for being here and being open to discussing and, and sharing your own experiences as well and and reach mm -hmm. out to samantha definitely jump on mm -hmm. um build mm -hmm. with her and maria power with what they're doing 
um, I know I'm going to be right there next to them as well and, and really just helping just drive um, people and, and drive that message as well. And mm -hmm. again, follow me over to the States. That's what I'm going there for is just to get and, and to share that message that really just we need to work on ourselves. So love you lots. Um, let's just keep this conversation going. Um, share this in, in your pages if you can. Share this in the groups that you're a part of. Um, mm -hmm. And in, any men that need assistance or that feel that they're mm -hmm. being abused or, or abusing or just not sure as well, reach out because I've got a, a massive um, connection, a uh, community of male coaches and men's coaches mm -hmm. and group coaches mm -hmm. and, and um, people that have been through similar experiences and, and people that are willing to reach out and help as well. So if, mm -hmm. and for the women that want a male perspective as well, we're here as well. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're all banding together. Together we're better and, and mm -hmm. together we're going to do great things. So love you lots. We'll see you guys. Yeah. Bye guys.